Patty, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Um, so how would you categorize Year of the Monkey? Because it is all things from what I can see. <laughs> well, I, I think it, I, it's sort of in the middle of sort of fictional autobiography. Um, it's, it's myself, much of it is true, but it, 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 I allow it to veer into fiction and, and, um, and dream. Uh, sort of like uh, like Jean Genet did in um, uh, A Thief's Journal. I, I, I think it's a genre autobiographical nonfiction or fiction, autobiographical fiction. But I really, if, if I could choose, I would just let it be literature. It's, it's a bit of a travelogue as well, isn't it? Yes, it's a lot of things. I, I, what struck me is that you, you said you, you, know, you, you were getting all these rides with various people and going off in their direction. Did, did everybody know who you were? No. I mean, I can travel in America um, much easier without people, uh, not New York City perhaps, but in, in most of America, people have no interest. And that's quite, that's, I'm just a normal person. I'm not, no, I'm, I've never been normal, but I'm just a normal eccentric person. And uh, I couldn't travel like that, say, in Italy or certain, um, or France or certain parts of Paris, but um, because I'm more well known there. But I don't carry myself, people don't notice me really. I just carry myself and, as I do. You know, I don't have a persona, even on stage, I don't have an on stage persona. I'm just the same old person. Because <laughs> I find that quite extraordinary to think that people don't know who you are in, in America. Oh, trust me, they don't. <laughs> but uh, I mean, certain parts, but, um, but I, I, I traveled in writing that book. I rarely saw anyone that, uh, you know, stopped me or wanted to take their picture with me or something. And that's, that's pretty much how I live my life. Do you like it that way? Yeah, well, I, I like just uh, feeling you know, it, being free. Um, I, I don't conduct myself like a celebrity. I don't consider myself a celebrity. I know that my name after 50 years has gotten to a certain point and I'm grateful for that. But I was born a Smith and we're, a, you know, a common lot. The, 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 the act of writing that book, was that something that you needed to do? I mean, in that year, a lot of stuff happened, good and bad. Did, was there something compelling you to, com to commit to paper your thoughts about the Year of the Monkey? Yes, because I began uh, the book right after my 69th birthday. I was planning a trip with an old dear friend, Sandy Perlman, and he had a brain aneurysm uh, right before the, uh, the New Year's Eve. And I had this time slot um, suddenly where I was on my own. So I just decided to keep going. You know, um, he was unconscious in the hospital and I kept, kept tabs with him, but I, I just went to the places we were going to go on my own. And, but I, I hadn't any books or anything. I wasn't prepared to be on my own. So I wrote and I wrote every day in time. The book is written every day I wrote and um, it, it kept me company and um, and when I didn't have anything to read, it gave me something to read besides the Gideon's Bible that you can always find uh, <laughs> in, a, you know, in a bureau or something. But um, yes, I wrote every day and it, it unfolded as I went through the year. The, the, you're, you're very frank in the book about the loss that, that you suffered. Um, does it, did it make you, did it renew your sadness talking about, I mean, it's in the epilogue when you list your losses and we live with you, Sandy, and, and all the beautiful things you wrote about Sam Shepard as well. And we knew what, I mean, obviously now, a few years down the line, we know that Sam died in, in, in 2017. Yes. What, 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 it, this is, was, well, you, you must have felt sad in yourself just recounting all those losses. Well, it depends. Sudden, I mean, um, those feelings are intermittent. I mean, some days, that have no specific importance. I feel the loss of all my loved ones tremendously. Uh, today is a very nice day. It's Remembrance Day. Um, my father uh, was uh, a veteran in World War II. I deeply miss him. 
But I think of Remembrance Day as something wonderful. It's a day set aside, and I, oh, I think of my mother and my husband and my brother and all of these people um, on, on a nice day set, set aside for them. And um, in other days, it's very painful. And we, we just have to accept the whole package, um, the, the privilege of knowing these people and the joy they've given us, and also the pain of, of missing them. But um, I try to keep it balanced. I allow myself to be happy that I just knew them, you know, and, uh, and that they're still about. Uh, in fact, my mother continues to scold me about everything. She's been gone f since 19, uh, since 20, 20, uh, yeah, right after September, 2001. Yep. And she, I can still hear her saying, Patricia, you know, brush your hair, <laughs> or Patricia, be careful go go going across the street, or, you know, be more practical. But I can hear, I can hear her. It's so nice to be scolded. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. How, how do you find, um, I, I did something with Ian McKellen recently, and he was really quite talkative on this subject. I mean, the process of ageing, which is happening to us all, and we know, you know, I think it is different for men than it is for women. Um, I mean, how are you finding, you know, being 72? Well, I, I, I really, it really hit me when I turned 70 uh, within the book only because of the chronology. Being a mother, I would like to be around as long as I can. I mean, God grant me a long life so I can do my work, continue to write, and watch my children grow. Um, as far as the aging process physically, yes, I, I missed when I had really black hair. Now it's all kinds of different silvery colors. And, um, you know, we all feel the aches and pains of aging. But also, the trade-off is all the experience that we have. Suddenly, uh, I find myself um, you know, more facile. Um, I find myself being able to articulate myself better when I'm writing all the experience I have as a performer, a singer. Um, in some ways, I'm much better. Uh, I might not look as, uh, I might not have that certain look anymore, but I can feel my innate powers. So. There's some uh, really positive aspects of aging. Does it help poetry? Does it help your words? I mean, you've just touched on, on that. Having, you've got so much more to refer to, haven't you? Yes, exactly. I, 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 but I think that, you know, we have to, it's very important to keep your enthusiasm, you know, to maintain the language of enthusiasm, to be curious, to keep working. And um, those are the kind of things that keep us agile, that keep us vibrant and healthy. And um, more than uh, people, you know, turn to cosmetic surgery or all these different things, those things are very surface. They're not really going to necessarily um, magnify, um, you know, your youthful or creative potential. And it just, I just think keeping engaged and happy, smiling, very good youth serums. We've got a really weird um, relationship here in this country with older people, with ageing. There are a lot more of us than there ever were. Um, uh, with ageing, with death, we, we just don't, we're not very good at going there. And what, what, is the, what is the way of navigating that? I mean, we, is it talking about it more or what is it? Well, I just, I think that we have to um, accept the whole package of life. Obviously, I don't want to die. I don't want to, um, I would like to be here as long as I can. But, you know, life is a beautiful gift. We each have our life. And I've just learned that, you know, you have to take a breath and, and accept that there's always going to be difficulties. You're going to, um, everyone is going to have strife, a, a certain amount of loss, perhaps health issues, um, and then even more terrible, uh, be victims of war, poverty. I mean, every single person uh, has to navigate, you know, their share of uh, difficulties. But every single person still has their measure of joy. And we have to not let our measure of joy slip away while we're dealing with the more difficult things. We have to keep a sense of humor. We have to 
Um, you know, when, when my late brother died, he was 42, we laughed all the time. And my sister, brother, and I used to get in trouble for laughing. We used to get punished because we couldn't stop laughing. And when he died, um, of course, we were heartbroken, devastated. But there was a moment um, right before the funeral where my sister and I were sitting and we said, I said something silly and then it got her laughing and we could not stop laughing. And we knew that my brother was with us. He was an instigator of laughter. You have to be able to embrace the whole spectrum of, uh, of what's being offered us. You, you are many, many, many things. Um, <laughs> you're such an idol to so many people. I mean, a, a poet, but, but I mean, I think you've always had a, a, that, that activism, that, that awareness of what's going on and the willingness to step out and talk about it from a, from a young age. Do you think our youth today are the same youth that, of the 60s and 70s? I mean, is it the world, goodness, is a different world, but are they as engaged as you guys were? Are they more engaged? What do you think, Patty? Well, I think we can't judge each generation. Each generation has to translate how they maneuver their time. But when you look at our very young people, um, the, the girl Greta, Greta Thunberg, Thunberg, I mean, she's what, 15, 16 years old, and she is motivating young 14, 13, 12-year-olds all over the world. And they're, they're very aware of what's happening and what's happening to our planet. I have to say, when I was 12 years old, I was, you know, I had a no my nose in a book. I was roaming around a, a forest with my dog. I had no sense of the strife of the world. And young people are confronted with a lot more than uh, we were confronted. So we have to be fair um, and we have to step back. And it's very easy to criticize each generation and say they're too involved in social media, they're too involved in this. But I think it's more important to see what are they doing that is um, productive and what are they concerned about and how can we help them and even more important, support them. And so when young Greta says, don't think of the, the, our youth as being hope, the hope, get out there and join us. And uh, I think that's a good uh, case in point. They're, 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 they're burgeoning. They're burgeoning. There are beloved dandelions, wildflowers, and they're sprouting all over the world. So do you think it's better now than it was? I mean, the, the, the world, when you, look, when you step back and look at the world, and I mean, we, every day we open the paper and it's Trump said this, and this is happening, and there's Brexit, and there's, there's war, and there's everything, and it goes, it comes in on us a little bit. I can't say that I think things are better. I think things seem worse than any time I can remember, whether it's our environment, all of the corruption, all of the... the, the the, the greed and, and, uh, and the destruction of, of our environment. And uh, there's so many things in our, and, the, and people who are displaced and, and the migrant crisis. I, I can't remember such a difficult time. And again, as I said, when I was very young, you know, I was allowed to be innocent, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, just reading Little Women and, and uh, you know, walking with my dog. I, I had no sense of what all the suffering that was going on in the world. Young people now are very aware of it. Which, which is a good thing. Um, as a woman in, in music, when you came to the music industry, I mean, obviously this is another big massive talking point and another big awakening, if you like. Um, were you always treated fairly as a woman? Or do you look back on instances which perhaps some, many of us do and think, shouldn't have let them get away with that no well I was always a fighter and I you know I I was not ambitious in terms of fame and fortune although at different times of my life I I enjoyed both things uh, or some some of it I only wanted to do good work so I would fight and do what I wanted and it often meant I might be punished or ostracized or marginalized but I took that as part of the um, of the bargain I would be told if I didn't do things a certain way, 
I wouldn't be as successful, but I did things my way. And so I, I don't feel, I don't feel as if I was oppressed because I was able to do everything the way that I wanted. I had more oppression or more because of my political views. Um, not so much, I think, because of my gender. But I've never been that concerned about gender as an artist. I always thought that, you know, art should not have a gender. You know, art should, if, you know, I didn't want to be labeled in any way, you know, whether a female vocalist, you know, you know, a, a white American poet, you know, I, it, it's ridiculous. You know, if your work stands, then it stands on its own without a label. But, I mean, that's very topical here because we have a, a, our equivalent of uh, our big music award term is the Brit Awards, and there's a movement to remove the best female and best male categories and just have best art artist um, to take away the gender thing. Do you think that's a good move? I don't know. I think sometimes we overthink all of these things. Uh, these things don't really preoccupy me. Um, um, I've, I'm, I'm not... Um, it's, it, I just think people have to work these things out for themselves. Well, when, when we have an, an artist that come over from America, we end up talking about <coughs> President Trump because he provides so much material. Uh, must uh, we? <laughs> <laughs> Um, does it bother you being asked about him? I mean, pretty much every American artist that comes our way um, kind of goes right round to him. Um, it well, it <laughs> bothers me that uh, a person um, who, who, you know, representing our country, also representing us, you know, is such, um, you know, uh, an uneducated um, uh, man lacking empathy, compassion, a sense of history, a sense of the importance of uh, allies, uh, uh, the importance of opening up one's doors to, to people who, who are experiencing strife. I mean, there's not a single thing that he has done that, well, I shouldn't say that, maybe one or two things he might have done. Uh, but all in all, his, um, what he's done to our environment, um, his lack of comprehension of the importance of uh, the global conversation about our environment there, and, and the way that he uh, conducts himself. You know, he's not very honorable, he's very narcissistic. So it's like every single day uh, one could be angry, humiliated, or um, shocked at uh, the things that he does. But, you know, I sometimes I have to step away from it and just be able to live and do my work, take care of my family, and um, then step back in, say what I can. Or, but um, I just hope that people can grasp that he does not represent the lion's share of the American people. Perhaps the answer is what we were talking about. It's young people. And there's a really big movement here now to give the vote to 16-year-olds to lower the voting age. Well, what do you think about I think that um, a lot of that will be hinge on education, you know, how well um, that our youth is educated in, in how important the vote is and that uh, it, it's, it's uh, something that needs to be taken care of uh, seriously, but also re showing them how much potential power they have, which is a good thing, and um, that they can make change and they can um, uh, initiate uh, um, the things and, and lobby for the things that they think are important at such a young age. Um, and so understanding what a vote means and the, and the potential power it has, um, if, they, if they're ready for it, God bless them. So finally, what, what's your next journey? <laughs> My next journey. <laughs> ah, well, uh, funny enough, I'm after I, I have to go to Berlin and after London to um, uh, do a, re a remembrance, a small remembrance concert with my pianist for the, uh, because it's the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall, um, and um, then I'm going to South America to tour. I'm very uh, excited about that. Especially, we'll be going to Chile. And um, I think I'm very 
I'm very, uh, I'll be very curious and happy to meet the young people in Chile who have, you know, joining all ages in Chile, trying to rise up, not trying, rising up to make change in their country. It's 30 years since the war went down. That's not long ago, how quickly the world moves. Well, it's also uh, November 4th is Robert Maplethorpe's birthday. I'm also doing a little concert, my own Remembrance Day concert. And it's also the 25th anniversary of my husband's passing. And I, I still remember the moment I first saw him, like it was yesterday. And to imagine that he's been off the earth for 25 years is, it just seems unimaginable. But yes, time passes quickly.